Okay, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. Preacher had finished his sermon for the day, walked to the back of the uh, uh, auditorium where he was there to greet people and shake hands as they were leaving from the worship service. In line that day was the seven-year-old son of the congregation's chairman of the elders. Good morning, Jonathan, the preacher said as he reached out to shake Jonathan's hand. As he did so, he felt something in the palm of Jonathan's hand. What is this? With a big smile on his face, Jonathan said, it's money. It's for you. (laughs) Preacher said, I can't take your money, Jonathan. The seven-year-old son of the chairman of the elders insisted, no, I, I want you to have it. And after a short pause, Jonathan continued, My daddy says you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. (laughs) So I thought you needed this more than I did. Having said that, for the third week in a row, it has nothing to do with the message. (laughs) Thought I'd share it with you anyway. Shiner, Texas claims to be the cleanest little city in Texas. It has a population of a little over 2,000 people. On June 9th of 2012, one young family had invited several friends to their farm for a barbecue, and included amongst the guests was a 47-year-old man who had recently been hired to help with the horses. When someone saw the farmhand carrying off the four-year-old daughter of the host to a secluded area. She immediately alerted the father. When the dad heard his daughter's screams, he ran toward the horse barn where he found the farmhand sexually assaulting his daughter. The dad pulled the man from the daughter and began punching him in the head, in the neck, And when he called 911, the father said, I need an ambulance. This guy was raping my daughter and I beat him up. Call lasted about five minutes as the dispatcher was trying to locate where this remote ranch was. Please hurry, he said. This guy is going to die on me and I don't know what to do. In fact, he told the dispatcher that he would put the the man in the back of his pickup and, and take him to the hospital himself. But about that time, uh, the sheriff's deputies arrived but the 47-year-old assailant had already died. After listening to the witnesses and examining the evidence, a grand jury in Lavaca County refused to indict the dad responsible for beating uh, to death the man who had assaulted his daughter. The family lawyer said of the young father, and I quote, he had no intention of killing anybody on that day. This will be on his conscience the rest of his life. One resident of Shiner summed up kind of what everybody in town felt, and what many people were saying, and I quote, I don't think he should be arrested for it. I don't think any charges should be filed. The dead assailant got what he deserved. Sometimes in life, we get what we deserve. And sometimes in life, we get that which we don't deserve. Life isn't always fair, is it? In a world where evil often times seems to triumph, and in many cases even flourish, a world where righteous people oftentimes suffer, we need to be reminded of the truth that someday God is going to make it all right again. Galatians chapter 6, each week we have endeavored to find a text in the New Testament that kind of coincides with our reading from the Old Testament. So I'm going to begin reading from verse 4 where the Apostle Paul writes, Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the Word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. 
you will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. If you take out the outline there on the inside of your bulletin, first of all, we see that many receive what's right and fair. Depending upon one's translation, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in the beginning, the earth was formless and empty. In the beginning, it was a shapeless, chaotic mass. In the message, Eugene Peterson writes, earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. And in Genesis, every time God spoke, he brought more order into that which was once chaos. God brought both a natural order and a moral order to the universe. There are natural laws that God has set into motion so that His creation knows how to operate, so that creation knows there is some order to life. Hot air always rises. Gravity causes objects to fall. Light illuminates and and invades the darkness. Uh, Two things certain in life, death and taxes. Okay, so maybe that isn't one of them. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Okay, that's not either. But I do know this is a natural law that God has put into existence. A happy wife is a happy life. Okay, so I know you'll agree with me. (laughs) But one of the moral laws that God has established is found here in verse 7 of our text. We reap what we sow. We harvest in direct proportion to what we have planted. We get what we deserve. And that principle is found in other places throughout Scripture as well. One of Job's friends, Eliphaz, verbalized this well-known truth centuries ago when he said, my experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. King David wrote, the wicked dig a deep pit to trap others, then they fall into it themselves. The trouble they make for others backfires on them, and the violence they plan falls on their own heads. His son Solomon writes, whoever sows injustice reaps calamity, but the generous will themselves be blessed. And the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And if I can translate, those who work hard will be blessed with more in return than those who hardly work. Those who try to get ahead will find themselves ahead of those who barely try at all. God told His people, when you listen to Me, when you follow Me, when you obey Me, you will be blessed. If you ignore Me, if you run from Me, if you disobey Me, you will be cursed. Uh, We've read far enough through the Old Testament by now, if you're going with us through the chronological Bible this year. We've seen that principle over and over again. In fact, sometimes God's patience went way beyond what God's people deserved. He would say, now if you obey me, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you. If you disobey me, here's what's going to happen. But many times, they really had that, that, that punishment coming much sooner. But that's when God stepped in and demonstrated grace even in the Old Testament. Most of the time, God showed leniency to His people, even when they didn't have it coming, even when they shouldn't have received it. And most of the time, I don't know if you've noticed this, but God would honor repentance even if it was just a a little bit of the way, even if somebody just said, hey, Lord, I pray and I'm sorry. God would honor that. So He demonstrated His grace over and over in the Old Testament. When Jeremiah, in our reading this week, shared with God's people the bad things that were going to happen to them. God said, now Jeremiah, listen, they will ask you, why has the Lord decreed such terrible things against us? What have we done to deserve such treatment? What is our sin against the Lord our God? They didn't get it. 
They had been told time and time again, here's what happens when you obey the Lord, here's what happens when you disobey the Lord. They had been reminded of that over and over again. And so when Jeremiah tells them again, they still don't get it. On another occasion, Jeremiah said, turn from your evil ways, each of you, and do what is right. And the people replied, listen, Jeremiah, don't waste your breath. We're going to continue to live as we want to, stubbornly following our own evil desires. That was their words. You don't have to tell us a thing, Jeremiah. We're going to do what we want to do no matter what you say. Don't waste your breath. Those who sow a lot of seed in a field will have a larger harvest than those who sow little seed in a field. Those who work hard, who treat others right, who are honest, will go a lot farther in life than those who are lazy and dishonest and expect things to be given to them. Those who eat right, get plenty of sleep, exercise regularly, don't smoke, don't drink alcohol in excess, they're going to live longer than those who eat too much or, or sleep too little or don't exercise or smoke or abuse alcohol. Those who invest in others by being friendly will find themselves having friends. Those who practice in athletics, those who practice in music are going to be better than those who hardly practice at all. Those who study hard are going to have better grades than those who don't study at all. The more we put into life, the more we're going to get out of life. Most of the time, people are rewarded for the good things they have done and disappointed punished for the bad things they have done. Most of the time, that is true. But experience shows us, uh, number two here, that some receive what's not right and fair. Sometimes we see exceptions to those principles, don't we? For whatever reason, some people are so gifted academically or musically or, or uh, athletically they do better when they hardly practice than some of us who would practice really hard. For some reason, we read on occasion, someone lives to be 100 years old and they've been a chain smoker all of their life. And Satan loves to amuse us or, or remind us, I should say, of the exceptions to, to these principles. Satan loves to question the justice of God. Satan wants to plant doubt in our mind as to how fair God is by pointing out these exceptions to us because Satan wants us to turn away from God. So if bad things happen to good people, Satan likes to question, well, what in the world are you following him for? Was it fair that 3,000 people lost their lives on 9-11 when 19 Al-Qaeda terrorists hijacked four United States passenger planes and then used them as suicide bombs. Was that fair? Had any of those nearly 3,000 innocent victims or anyone from their families, had any of them personally slandered or threatened or bullied or hurt the 19 men who took their lives? Was it fair when, a jo when Job, a man described in the Bible as blameless, of complete integrity, who feared God, who stayed away from evil. Was it fair when Job lost all ten of his children? When he lost thousands of his livestock? When he lost most of his servants? When he was afflicted with a skin disease so painful that he tried to find relief by scraping his skin with pottery? Is that fair? Was it fair when Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt? Well, granted, Joseph had a little bit of an ego problem, but really, was he that bad that his brothers had to stage his death and then lie to their father about what had happened to Joseph? Was it fair when Joseph was falsely accused of trying to rape his boss's wife when the truth was he was trying to run away from her when she grabbed his clothes and pulled them off of him? Pulled them off of him? Was it fair that Joseph had to sit in prison for four years for things that he hadn't done? Was it fair when Jeremiah was falsely accused of inciting treason against the king 
when he was flogged, when he was put into a dungeon cell, when he was lowered into a cistern and there had to sit in this mucky layer of mud at the bottom, when he was starved. Was any of that fair? Is it any wonder sometimes that God's people are afraid to speak out when we see what happens to people like Jeremiah when they do speak the truth, when they are abused for doing so? When police raided the home of Wanasa Thamathiva on May 28th of this year in Georgia, they had a warrant to do so because this man had, had sold methamphetamine to a, an undercover police officer the night before. So they go to his house with a warrant the next night. What the police didn't know is that Thamathiva wasn't home. What the police didn't know was that some friends from Wisconsin whose home had burned down were at his house that night. Before invading the house, the SWAT team threw a stun grenade through the door of the house, standard procedure for distracting the suspect they were after. Unfortunately, the stun grenade landed on the pillow in the crib of a 19-year-old boy or 19-month-old boy named Boo Boo, exploded near his face and his chest. Police, they weren't trying to harm anyone. They were just following normal protocol. But the the family now found themselves dealing not only with a burned home but a 19-month-old son who was fighting for his life, all without income, all without health insurance. Life isn't fair. It isn't always fair, I should say. Jesus said that God causes his son to rise on evil people as well as the good. Sometimes rain falls on the righteous as well as the unrighteous. In fact, Jesus promised to those who would follow him in this world, you're going to have troubles. We live in a broken world. We live in a fallen world. Because God gives us free will to make our own choices, bad people will do bad things, oftentimes even to good people. Satan's express purpose is to steal our joy, kill our hope, destroy our relationships. And as we look around, we see that he's doing a pretty good job. And he uses the lie to promise those who will listen to him, who will do his bidding. He promises them things that he's not authorized to give anyway. He convinces people that we need to be more concerned with me, my happiness, my needs, my wants, my future, before anyone else's. He confuses us to focus on the things that are in the here and the now, the things that we can see and touch and forget about the things and our goals for the future. I understand. Sometimes... People receive blessings in this life they don't deserve, and other times people suffer for things and they don't deserve that. Our choices and our sins that we make on a daily basis, they have a ripple effect throughout all of society and throughout everything and everyone. In fact, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8 that all of creation has suffered because of our sin. All of creation! And Paul says that all of creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from this death and this decay that we all experience. Praise the Lord, we believe in a God who is miraculously, powerfully, providentially using every experience in our lives, the good ones and the bad ones, the good people and the bad people, to bring about something that is good and glorious. You see, we believe in a God who guarantees that all will someday receive what they choose. 
You see, here's an undeniable um, reality. We must all someday stand before Christ to be judged. Each of us will receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil that we have done while on this earthly body. Translated, our eternal future is based on our present choices. You see, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. God sees all. He he hears all. He knows all. And only God is qualified to judge us. We may try to fool others. We may even try to fool ourselves as to why we do the things that we do or the motivation behind the things that we do. We may lie to others about those things. We may lie to ourselves, but God always knows the truth. Not a one of our sins, not our motivation behind those sins is hidden from God. You want to know it wasn't fair? It wasn't fair when Jesus was falsely accused of inciting treason against Herod. It wasn't fair when he was beaten. It wasn't fair when he was flogged, when he was spat upon. It wasn't fair when he was crucified on a cross. What did Jesus do to deserve that kind of horrible treatment? What sin had he committed? None. None. Not once did Jesus use language or words that he shouldn't have used. Not once did Jesus tell an off-color joke. Not once did Jesus look with lust at another woman. Not once did Jesus do something out of his own personal pride instead of obedience to God. Not once did Jesus try to be funny by telling a lie. Not once did Jesus take something that didn't belong to him. So why was he beaten and why was he crucified? As a substitute for me and you. Because we're sinning all the time. And that, my friends, is grace. A divine grace that's pretty difficult to wrap the human mind around. Grace is what God gives us that we don't deserve. And mercy is when God doesn't give us the punishment we do deserve. We don't deserve forgiveness, but because of Jesus, God forgives us anyway. We do deserve punishment, but because of Jesus, God gives us mercy instead. Our worst days are never so bad that we are beyond the reach of God's grace, but our best days are never so good that we're beyond the need of God's grace. No matter how bad or how good I am, I am in need of God's grace. No matter how bad or good you are, you are in need of God's grace. Furthermore, God's grace refuses to leave us where we're at. God cleanses us from our sin through the blood of Christ. And then God redeems that sin by empowering us and preparing us and equipping us and changing us so that we can learn from our past mistakes and minister to others in Jesus' name. Sometimes even because of our past mistakes, we can relate to them. We know how to minister and help them. Ronald Harris Sr. was preparing to preach a revival service to over 70 people in his church last September in Lake Charles, Louisiana. He was a godly man. Picked up his five grandchildren from school every day, took them out for a a snack. He was a godly pastor who knew how to preach about the penalty of, of man's sin while at the same time the power of God's love. And as, so, as Harris and four others were on stage that night leading the congregation in some praise music before he was to speak, a 53-year-old former member burst into the service and mortally shot Ronald Harris twice. His daughter said later that if her dad could talk to her killer, he would say, I forgive you, and I love you. Now get on in and worship, brother, and let God visit your mind. You see, when, when God's grace gets hold of people, man, it totally changes us. I mean totally. 
Elizabeth came from an exceptionally broken and destructive family, a family that, that included abuse and prison and suicide. And at 16 years of age, Elizabeth was crying out to her mentor, it isn't fair. It isn't fair. What did I do to deserve to be raised in a family that is this dysfunctional? What did I do? And I, I suspect that while many of us would have coddled her and agreed with her, Elizabeth's mentor was wise enough at that point to confront the young lady's attitude. You're right, Elizabeth. You don't deserve this life. You deserve hell and death, and so do I. But God's gracious love for us provided a Savior who took our sins upon Himself and died for them. He didn't deserve to die, and we don't deserve to live. But because of God's grace, we get to live because Jesus died. And you know, it just it hit her. At that moment, totally changed her, her attitude from disappointment to hope, from anger to gratitude, from bitterness to freedom. And her life was never the same. What about us? Not a one of us deserves God's love. Not a one of us deserves God's forgiveness. But because of God's grace and as a result of Christ's sacrifice, we receive what none of us deserves. And when we figure that out, it frees us to live like no one can live. And that's all because of Jesus. So if we're going to accept from God what we don't deserve, then we better live and we better love like no one else can. Because as Paul wrote in our text, he said, those who sow to the flesh in this life will someday reap the consequences for doing so. Those who sow to the Spirit in this life will someday reap the rewards for doing so. And Paul says, because you know that, let's not get tired of doing what is good. For at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up.